Hello? Hi. Um, so I'm going to start with some diagrams. Uh, this is a person. This is a VR experience. Uh, this is a person in a VR experience. This is a person engaging with a VR experience. And I'm going to use these diagrams moving forward. So for clarity's sake, I wanted you to get some context for that. Um, I'm going to dive right in and talk about story, because that's like the hot topic now with VR, right? Um, and I want to start with traditional. And this might seem kind of obvious, but I, this is how I like to parse you can even tell, parse my information in my own brain to make it make some sense out of it. So um, we have an experience. The experience affects us. We are then wanting to express that experience to someone else. And so we reflect on that experience, we filter it, and we craft a thing for that person. And that thing is called story. And as the presenter of that thing, I'm the storyteller. And how I go about doing it uh, is the medium. VR is different, because what it does is this. And so like the idea of story and the storyteller and the medium all kind of lose a little bit of footing. And people freak out. Don't panic. Here's why. If we keep going with this, uh, so the person that goes into the experience you know, is affected by it, sensing a pattern. Um, she wants to express that to someone else. And the storyteller and the story emerge. Um, but I'm not the storyteller anymore. The person in the experience is, and the story is more of an afterthought to the experience. So my job is really to craft for that occurrence. So I'm going to get out of the way a little bit. Um, so I'm of the mindset that there are two kinds of stories, or two story states. The first is kinetic, and the second is potential. If you're wondering if I got this from science, you are correct. Um, and VR prefers potential. Um, what we want to do is craft for the potential of story. Now, I know this is a design conference, primarily, so uh, I use the uh, gradient tool to, uh, to illustrate how the story itself isn't really a thing so much as a range. Um, it's not one singular story. There, there are many permeations, perhaps uh, infinite. Um, so, you know, no one takes the same thing away from an experience. So as a creator, I have to be like, what can I craft as an experience that allows for the potential of this gradient of story for someone to tell? So how do we go about doing this? And here's what's exciting, craft. Um, let's talk about worlds and world building. As a traditional filmmaker, uh, I love the frame, right? I craft frames. Um, and uh, the unfortunate thing is that in VR, that's totally wrong. <laughs> So I have to rethink it. Uh, in VR, the frame is wherever uh, an audience member or a person that's in the experience is going to look. Uh, and that is the frame. But I, um, I can't premeditate that on my own. I can't say, this is the frame and you must look here. Um, they're going to do whatever they want. So really, um, it's about the potential of frames, and the frames are everywhere. Um, so this is actually an unfortunate way of looking at it. Um, instead of looking at VR content like this, we should probably look at it more like this. Right? A world of experience, a world of potential frames. And so instead of a box or instead of a frame, we should probably think of it more like this shape, which you've seen before. Now, editing in film is something very similar. It's frame to frame to frame. There's nuance to it, obviously, but that's generally what we're going for. Um, and because it's about worlds, um, editing in VR is more about the universe. Worlds that extend from other worlds. And my job as a creator is to help uh, pull you along through that universe. Now, if it was just about worlds, I could just set up a 360 rig and film anything, and you would love it. Uh, but that's not how it works, right? Um, it's just as much about the person that's in the experience as it is about the world. And so we talk a lot in VR about this idea of presence. An important thing to shift here is the language of how we refer to the person in our experience. Viewer, stop it. It's not the viewer. Viewer is an objective person. You see something in a cinema. You see something um, in a theater. You are objective to it. Now that you're actually visiting these worlds, it makes sense to maybe call you a visitor. And suddenly, because of that shift in language, everything else starts to fall into place in terms of how we deal with the craft, uh, crafting that uh, experience. So the first thing to talk about is attention. Um, 
you know, let's go back to this glacier climber. Um, I have a pretty solid understanding of where someone will most likely look. I'm never 100% sure. Maybe people like random glacier stuff. But the idea is um, there's one person making a sound. Audio is very important. There's one person in the entire experience. So I can make a pretty good bet that they're going to look that direction. And that's an important thing to note, because if I can tell where someone's most likely going to look, I can then decide in the following world how I want that rotated or how I want to plan it so that they're looking at something that I think is important. I can meet their engagement with something that I think the following world has that could offer something great for them or something that can help move the story forward. Here's an example of, of, of that. Um, the Montreal Canadian ice hockey team, first ice hockey game I've ever been to. Um, uh, and it's, the, it's a torch ceremony, and I had a pretty good guess that people were going to watch the torch being passed. So this is what I did. Now, I could have just planted the ice rink there, but that wouldn't have been uh, nearly as, as much fun. Um, the, the, also, the, the thing to note is that if I had just done the ice hockey rink, um, you would have maybe missed him. But I th he's magic. He's like the best part of the whole thing. Um, and so if I have an understanding of where someone's going to begin and end in an experience, where they're going to focus, I can then create a sort of cipher, a solution to the cipher, right? Um, and suddenly I have a pathway to, uh, through the universe, and I ba basically have... Um, uh, cohesion with disparate stuff. I um, mean, I can actually, you know, use this as a previs. This is just, you know, in a montage state, I could basically figure out how to do a montage this way, or I can work backwards and create a story from the ground up with this in mind. Um, the world is messy, and it's very hard to pay attention to specific things, unless there's literally just one thing in the environment. Um, so then we have to think about not just the what's, but the how's and the why's of how we engage with, uh, with the world. Um, this is a tram scene. There's a lot to look at. Um, so, you know, we have multiple points of interest there. The, the thing to note about this is that no one in the actual tram is looking at you. So after a while of no one looking at you, you tend to start to think, well, what are they engaging with that they think is more important than me? Uh, and it was the windows and the view outside. So I actually used the windows and leveraged that um, in terms of being able to communicate in order to communicate with the visitor. Um, so I have this thing called extend and respond, which is if you're looking out the front or the back uh, windows of the tram, uh, I extend it uh, with the hallway of a horse stable in the following world. And it so happens that if you looked uh, to the left or the right in the tram through the window, I respond or I meet that with a horse face. Um, and you can sense that when people are in the experience, they'll like look out the side and they'll just be like, oh my god, or they'll turn like the horse is right there. So it's, I have some, some data that tells me that it's working. Um, it also works for spatial uh, orientation as well. If you're going to move someone through a space, the same space. Um, it's important to keep the orientation of where, you're, uh, where that person's engaging with, or I'm not even saying this right, the spatial engagement a person has consistent. Um, it's sort of like the 180 line in film, right? It's just disorienting if we have the same, like two people talking and they're both in the same side of the frame. Um, it's not like you can't not do that. You can totally mess this up, but then understand that there are repercussions of doing that. Um, and this is my favorite concept of all time, is rebellion. Um, we pay attention a lot to the literal, right? This scene that I shot is about a young girl playing violin. If you saw that, if you got that, great, that's what it's about. But um, instead what I do is if you decide you're gonna turn away from it, I have her parents watching from the door. And it's actually, I would argue, that's the better vantage point. Because they can hear the girl behind me playing violin kind of poorly, and the parents kind of grimacing and, and dealing with it. Um, and world function is, is important, too. Um, these are rocks in Iceland. Uh, I love them, but I, can't, I could not tell you where you were looking if you're in that experience. It's just like utter chaos. So, um, but chaos is good. If you think about video games, right? You know, we don't just jump in and have boss level moments. We, we, we start kind of calm and we work our way up. We build relationships with the world. We build relationships with other people. So um, it's nice to be able to have sort of a calm level to, to start with. And then you start thinking about the cohesion of how different worlds function differently. Um, a bedroom is different than a kitchen. A conference room is different than an orchestra, than a park, than a classroom. They all have functions. Um, and they all can help tell the story. Identity is also very important as well, like, you know, who are you? <laughs> are you a main character? Are you a secondary character? Are you a ghost? A little bit of a cop-out to be a ghost, but or you could be a ghost. Um, and, but that also kind of feeds into this idea of relationships. 
Um, a quick example is, again, Kennedy playing violin. If I were tall, like parent tall, adult tall, my relationship with her is, uh, has shifted. I'd look down on her. That's totally different than if I want to relate to her, in which case I'd want to be on her level. Um, in an orchestra, am I part of the orchestra? Am I the conductor? If I'm the conductor, why am I in the middle of the orchestra? Why is no one looking at me? That guy seems to be the conductor. Are there two conductors? So the world that you build has to reflect the identity of the person in it. Um, and something that I think is really important that VR is very good at is this idea of energy. I filmed this uh, at Google I.O. two years ago. Um, this is the rig being turned on for the first time in public. This is after they had seen the announcement and they came out to take photos. It's really weird. Uh, that guy doesn't even have time for you, you know? <laughs> um, but compare that to this, where you basically have, um, these are, it's the same, your, your camera, these are still engineers, um, except you feel great because they made you and they're just happy that you work, you know? And that's like, that's the difference, you know? Um, and it's, it, it resonates. How people treat the rig, how they treat the technology will transcend and affect the person. The person is there as soon as you push the record button. It's important to understand that because then you can start understanding how, you know, for acting or for other characters in the world, how they all kind of affect uh, what you're doing. Um, and Trisha talked about this yesterday, which I think is, is really important, is this idea of perception. Uh, Bo Lotto, uh, who's a neuroscientist, said, we never see the world as it actually is, but only the world that is useful for us to see. Um, and she showed six by nine. It's one of my favorite pieces. Um, how do you allow for a person to um, actually know what it feels like? Not just see. How do you feel like being in solitary confinement? Um, we see the color red differently than each other. We're going to leave this conference with different experiences, right? Uh, different stories to tell. Um, another way is just also how do we get rid of certain sensory experiences? How do we do something like Notes on Blindness, where we actually use audio as the, the way of visualizing a space? Or, um, and this one's going to be a little trippy, so um, this is actually Deep Dream uh, in VR, and Deep Dream is an artistic um, uh, project that uh, is being done with by our uh, artificial intelligence team at Google. Um, and what's really cool about it is like there are a lot of really awesome um, art projects that are actually coming from machine learning. We as humans have a very limited perception of the world. Um, and I believe very strongly that the art coming from AI can help us understand parts of the you know, world that we can't see and ways that we can't see. And I think there's some really interesting stuff we can do there. Um, so story again. Uh, this is heavy stuff. There's a lot of things we can do. Um, so where, how do we begin? Where do we begin? And I've got a theory. And step one, we're gonna go back to my gradient tool experiment here, is um, what's the potential story? Like what are you comfortable with as the takeaway? It's never gonna be exactly what you want. You just gotta get used to that fact. It's gonna be a range of things. So your job as the creator is to understand what you would want to be that range. You have to unpack the story. What other aspects of the story are there? What are other ways I could tell the story, right? What's that range look like? Step two, who is the visitor? Like really think on that. That actually has, um, it permeates everything. If you're the hero, and you're expected to be the thing that drives the story and you have no agency to change anything, then are you the hero? Is that fair? Uh, if you're a secondary character, um, you know, do people look at you? Do people interact with you? Are you acknowledged? Are you familiar to them? What's that relationship like? And if you're a ghost, then what kind of ghost? Am I like the height of an average guy? Am I the height of the average woman? Am I the height of an average kid? What's my perspective there? Um, and, you know, perception feeds into this too. How am I seeing the world? What kind of brain do I have while I'm in here? What experiences have, have happened to my character that, that make me see the world differently? Um, and how, how can I have that shared experience with, with that character? Um, the third uh, is the rules of the universe. Um, you know, can you inhabit another character? Can you move around physically? Can you steal people's hats? Um, you know, can you walk away? Can you be like, I see what's going on, I wanna go over there. Is that allowed? Can you do that? Is it important that you feel the urge to do that? And you keep going back into this, right? You go to back to the story and you say, okay, now that I know who they are, now that I know about this, like how do, how do they all change? And you refine, and you refine, and you unpack, and you refine. And it's like any writing process that takes forever, and then you can get to step four. 
And that's when I believe you can start to build. Thank you.